And uh, my name is Alexander. I'm uh, the assistant organizer for this course. And we're starting with something like really special that I hope you like. We have uh, Stuart McDonald, who is uh, who has a very long history in game art and art direction. And he's going to be talking about design lessons and world building. And let's give a round of applause to Stuart. And By a lot of experience, you mean old. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, first off, my name is Stuart MacDonald, um, and you might know it's a slight Scottish accent. Um, I hope you can all understand it. Okay, I'll try to speak slowly. Um, when I moved to Finland, two guys in my uh, team said that it took them five months to understand the accent. So we've got roughly five minutes, so I hope that was an exaggeration. Um, okay, so when I came to write this talk, I realized it's been 16 years now I've been in the industry and that, uh, over that time my passion and focus uh, for the art and games has been specifically with world building. So uh, that actually could be partly because of my previous career. Before coming into the games industry I practiced architecture and actually taught architectural design at university as well. Architecture is an interesting background to come to from games. Uh, the architect has to do what the game's job equivalent is of level designer and artist, all the time reflecting budget limitations, client wishes and technical requirements. This skill set actually explains probably why I came into the industry with an appreciation of both balancing the uh, art and the function of uh, creating interesting player experiences. So my passion for architectural design and a love of video games led me into games art. It was somewhere where I felt I could design and create new spaces quite freely, so I moved into environment art and eventually came to art direction. The largest part of my career was in Rockstar North. You obviously probably know these guys. Uh, based in Edinburgh in Scotland, it's the studio that was formed from DMA. The studio created and continues to lead development on GTA. Uh, I started working as an environment artist, working on the countryside environments of San Andreas. At the time, I was the only artist on all the landscape between all three cities in San Andreas, so it was quite a baptism of fire for the project. Uh, after that, I went on to GTA 4 and worked on New York, specifically the uh, Brooklyn area uh, near the Manhattan Bridge for uh, GTA 4, so that's four years there. And then finally, I was lead environment artist on GTA 5, where I was tasked with the initial creation and layout of the world beyond the main city. Uh, I led the team for approximately 18 months before I moved on to explore experiences elsewhere. I'd done 3D, three GTAs. Um, so I decided to move somewhere colder and darker than Scotland. So I came here to Finland. That's where I ended up at Remedy Entertainment for the past four years. Starting on a short project with Alan Wake, American Nightmare. I was lead environment artist on that too. That's great because I got an opportunity to, to learn about color grading and do more concept art, work that I hadn't really got to do in uh, working on Grand Theft Auto. And then after that, we started work on Quantum Break and I was promoted to art director. It was quite a challenge for a freshly minted art director because here I was, new art director, and I was on a new IP on a new platform with new technology because we're developing GI and also moving to physically based rendering, something that means you actually have to train your artists a lot uh, to change their attitudes over how shaders work. Um, also, as well as that, we had some interesting design challenges and pre-production, which I'll talk about later. Lastly, with pre-production and the majority of visual development completed and the project with just over a year to completion, I moved on to new challenges and experiences. I decided to try my hand at mobile development at Playraven, where I'd be working on the visual development of new titles. Again, new IP, new worlds, new interesting challenges for me and a new platform. Mobile is something I was intrigued with. Almost all the games I'd worked on had taken between two and a half and four years of development. And now I was in mobile where 
it might take between six months to a year. So to experience the tighter project life cycles and the different creation processes of mobile would be an interesting challenge. I have to be honest and say, large narrative driven filmic influenced games really is my, my, my love, but I also enjoy the challenge of creating new IP. And I knew that that's not a typical uh, mobile game development environment. Fortunately, PlayRaven are attempting to create something a little different and create fresh new games and new experiences for the mobile market. So creating memorable visuals is one of the ingredients of that ambition. So I've been around a bit and made some games. And the thing I really love about making games is the chance of building new worlds. So it's probably a little bit of the architect's ego in me. So production design. I wouldn't say art direction, more production design, because it's more about the pre-production of the, of the project, where you can win or lose. Um, Pre-production design might help others with art directing and developing visual design rule sets for creating a game world. These lessons have grown out of previous experiences from large AAA productions, from leading environment art teams to the whole direction of new IP. But should be useful no matter what size of the project. Um, a lot of these principles should apply to mobile too. Also, I thought I'd cover a couple of deeper takes on the use of visual tropes in games, both the good and the bad. Hopefully it will give you some food for thought on the bigger picture of art direction and tackling game art. Okay, so pre-production lesson one, you need effective pre-production. Pre-production is really what I'd consider the main work of the art director in production. Once you establish the visual rule set of the project, you're effectively steering the ship, dealing with issues and changes to the design and overseeing final quality in production. This rule, sh rule set should take into consideration technical limitations, advancements in games design and, and technology, iteration, story and plot changes. The hardest thing in the entire production is initially working out the vision of the project and where you want to go with the project's visuals. So what makes good pre-production? Well, at the end of the period, you need a few things. You have to get confidence in your team. The team needs to be confident about the visuals and the vision and the direction. This is immediately immensely helpful later in production when your team can iterate and expand on the content and still adhere to the visual direction. You build confidence externally. This is more for AAA when you're dealing with a publisher, but could also be for mobile if you're dealing with investors or marketing. You identify technical needs and issues, especially in AAA, you're normally at the bleeding edge of technology. You're always trying to, to uh, develop new rendering techniques and get closer to, to realism or, or uh, better production methods. And, uh, Good pre-production allows the technological adaption for the, the, uh, te the tech department can actually work out what you actually need for the project. Uh, gives a good visual rule set for later changes. What this means is failing to invest in pre-production can lead to generic looking product. Later in the, in the production, your team are short on time and may look to other games as reference when they need, need a visual to, for a piece of game art. Also, there will be difficulty adding new elements to the content, as without design rules, you have to design from scratch each time. Another one is building a brand foundation. One thing I never considered consciously before in AAA was branding and marketability. However, since moving into mobile development, you see spiraling UA cost and the need to stand out from a very crowded market. It makes designing in the potential to create a compelling imagery and a brand a necessity. Okay, let's cover style guides. Take time to consider elements you might need later in production, which may seem unimportant to you now when you start the style guide. For example, AAA, your UI and graphic design style. It'll get you later in development when you've got no time whatsoever you're busy tied up in cinematics, finalizing world visuals, polishing FX, etc. For us mobile, more importantly, 
and free to play, a poor or rushed UI or UX can actually directly lose you money. So you probably will cover that in a style guide. But then there's the importance of brand and marketing art style. Don't make tomes. This is something I've had to learn. Um, I've created a lot of PowerPoint presentations, both externally and internally. And by that I don't mean, I mean don't create huge multi-section art bibles. Do that later if there's a project or IP handover, but in pre-production it's counterproductive. You have to be aware of over-prescribing every aspect of a game's visuals. It seems obvious, but there are several reasons this is a bad idea. Also consider you might be under pressure from elsewhere to create these large visual guides covering all aspects of your game, or you find it organically grows over time. You need to keep on top of that and actually keep it very, very concise for a few reasons. It's a false promise. A detailed style guide is a false promise. Everything is, it tells you that everything is planned for and set in stone, but it's a living document even after pre-production ends. Projects change, and pre-production is more about setting up the intention and a robust plan than designing every detail of the project before production. And the truth is, usually these art by, huge art bibles are more of, often a marketing peer, piece for external sources like publishers. The team won't read it. They really won't. They'll probably look at some pictures, but they really won't look at the art, art bible. And, then, and that's the main reason for building this in the first place, is to ensure that it gets used by your team. You're also going to waste your time. Um, as the document grows, you'll find you're spending more and more time maintaining it. I mean, it becomes a, li a life of its own. And with every change, change or evolution in design, you end up having to update more and more of the art style guide. It takes you away from guiding your team and your team want access to you. They'll need to know you're there for them and not updating piles of PowerPoints and visual feature tables. Those things are later in art production, but hopefully you have an art producer or if you're doing it yourself, it's something for later. Uh, trust in your team. You provide the high level direction only and give the team room to use their creativity. You've hired these talented people, let them do their job. It's a classic management lesson, but it's even more true when you're an art director spread across a large team on a AAA project. Depending on your team size and abilities, there will always be areas you can spend little time on. You have to rely on the talents of your team to handle them. For example, my background is architecture. I'm not an animator, so I need people with those skills to actually help me in that area. And that's fine, you just have to accept that you can't micromanage every aspect of a project and letting go is always a, a struggle you'll have to fight, even now um, on a mobile project. I, I look at everything, um, including the marketing. So what do you do? How do you avoid these monster documents taking over your life? Well, it's really obvious stuff. And I've made all these mistakes, so. Keep it very high level. I eventually learn to distill the direction to a few clear pieces that often combine into a package that's easy to evolve, follow, and is inspirational to the team, and they will read it. Um, for example, on, in Remedy and Quantum Break, when we started uh, pre-production, I created PowerPoint after PowerPoint. New art director, super keen, um, wanted to create uh, a package on, on how the world was, what the characters looked like, what the effects was going to be. Each of these was a PowerPoint. It was crazy. I just ran away with it. And the, um, the team didn't read it. I, the publisher might, might have liked to see it because, they, you know, as I said, it builds confidence, and it does build confidence at a high management level, but the team don't see it. What I eventually did was created a single document with a one sheet for each of the, each of the aspects of the game with a statement and one or two images that I knew captured the essence of the project. But more of that later. Aim for a single image. Create a very stripped down set of one sheet images, as I said, 
that captures the aspect of the visual design that you're communicating. They don't need to be concepts. Try find a photo or a movie reference. Take your own photographs. It can save a lot of time, but the right image is worth it. Yeah, single line summary in key terms. Easy and quick to read. Coining a simple key term or features for the art direction will help immensely. The images and statement are clear guidance to the team. It was something they can work with and it will stay in their minds. It's like a, a pitch reel uh, or a pitch, a pitch line really to your team. Sizzle reels. Sizzle reels are awesome. I mean, many of you are probably familiar with them. But they're a montage of visual references from film, TV, video, comic books, anime. Sizzle reels are something more of a recent addition for me personally, but they're amazingly effective. They communicate aspiration for the visual direction and vibe that you're seeking to capture. After all, games are immersive, a moving experience. So why present a static image for something you're wanting to achieve? It's a commonly used tool in the movie industry. Um, in Remedy, one of our, uh, we had an effects artist from the VFX industry join us who had worked on titles like Prometheus and so, so on. And he told me about these sizzle reels and we actually integrated them into the production at Remedy. And it works really well. Level designers use them too. 